Today on The Reality Pill, we have one of my great friends from Spain down in Marbella. His name is Javier Gutierrez. He is a oral maxillofacial surgeon specializing in facial feminization surgery along with the facial team out in Spain. They are a world-renowned team with an incredible healing center in Marbella near the beach. Their results are just astounding. We have a bunch to show you today. It's mind-blowing what they're able to do in a natural way. We used to think that facial feminization had to make people look unnatural or a little fake. It's no longer the case. The surgeries they're able to do are incredible as well as the recovery techniques that they've developed over there. So please welcome Dr. Javier Gutierrez, a good friend of mine. So happy to have you here with us on the show. Thank you, Ben. It's my pleasure being here for your podcast and, and reality pre program. Yeah, facial team is different. I would say we practice FFS, facial feminization surgery, which is a very, very different, uh, completely out from all the typical procedures that normally are performed by facial surgeons. So we are specialized just in, as you have said, in, in the face, so as you. And uh, we just do, we are not doing like other surgeons in the world who also maybe can perform uh, surgery on the genitals or the breast or buttocks, whatever. So facial team is special for many reasons. One is the, the purely the specialization, and the rest is because we are a team of surgeons, but it's a real team. It's not just the, the typical place where you work with other colleagues, but you don't share anything than the place itself. So we collaborate uh, hand to hand. We operate hand to hand. We are six surgeons. Everyone is mostly specialized in some specific field, like maybe the forehead or just the nose or the lower jaw, whatever. So uh, that's the main, I think this is the main secret for the success of facial team. The super yeah, high, think, hyper specialization. And I've never seen uh a surgery center or retreat like yours um it's it looks like you're going to like a resort to recover and relax and enjoy because i've uh, heard from a lot of patients that i've sent for this kind of major work with uh, bony reductions of the brow mm -hmm. combined with rhinoplasty and jaw movements and stuff that they say oh no 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 way it's uh, i heard it has horrible recovery and i don't want to go so what's what's the reality of that the reality is that what we call is just the experience. It's not uh, just a pure surgery. They, we are working 95% of our patients are from abroad. So we are very used to uh, take care of the patient as if they were at their own home, which is very difficult to travel to a different country. Maybe you cannot speak even the language. And it depends, of course, uh, in Spain we speak English. But it's always di di difficult for the patient. So we try to take care of the patient as if he, uh, he or she doesn't have to worry about any other thing. So we look for the accommodation. They come to the hospital by private transfer service. And surgery itself, it may look scary. Maybe we're going to see some cases later. But uh, the post-op itself is very comfortable. They we have a, an advantage is that during the post of during the first 15 days, first month, everything is very numb. So this is protecting the patient to suffer from pain or having the main thing about the, the recovery itself is just the pure swelling because when you touch the bone and this is what we do mainly, we're restructuring the whole bone contour this gets very swollen. And that's why the post-operative period needs at least three to four weeks to recover, but not because of pain. And mm -hmm. as you know, we try to take care with different uh, therapies that during the post-op are very important, such as the lymphatic drainage uh, massage, therapy with different lights, such as your lead therapy, and also compression, Acupuncture, we believe in acupuncture too. And of course, Marbella itself. Marbella is a very great place. It's a completely out of the range. It's a, a very special uh, small town 
very well communicated with the uh, climate. The weather is very, very nice. It's not the, it's not very hot in summer and it's not very cold in winter. So we have like a very tropical uh, weather. It's the perfect place as, to, to uh, relax and to recover. Yeah. 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 And I've seen um, with, with our surgeries too, when I'm doing a lot of facelifts and the, the lip work that the effort you put into helping someone recover helps them a lot, uh, feeling comfortable going out again and feeling comfortable with their surgery. Because I feel that with these surgeries, especially on the face, there's a period after about maybe two weeks where the patients really start to feel sometimes a little depressed, sometimes anxious. Mm -hmm. uh, they start regretting things. They worry about things. It's a little bit of a brief depressive period. And I found that doing these treatments with, you know, what we do is the same, uh, not the same th different types, but with hyperbaric oxygen and with the LED light treatments uh, and lymphatic drainage sometimes that they end up getting through it more easily. Have you found that also? They, they just feel more comfortable going through the recovery? Sure, sure. And the, uh, as you said, this is the, the regretting times, no? This is the time where they regret having had surgery because what they see, they don't like, and it is going to be my face forever. Of course not. It's completely swollen, but this is just those therapies away from uh, surgical stuff with a physiotherapist or just uh, one hour of snap time or nap time. Mm -hmm. Uh, are helping a lot for their reassuring themselves. So we think this is essential for the success of the surgery too. Just how you treat the patient right after surgery. We offer also, uh, they, even when they are at their hotels, uh, nurses go to visit the patients and take care of the wounds, helping with very, very simple things such as washing the hair because our approaches are completely hidden, but on top of the head for the forehead. Uh, mm -hmm. So they need to wash their hair in a special way and maybe they can feel that they are lost. And just by the help of one nurse attending them, they, they feel very reassured. Yeah. So, so, so I've had patients, I, I've had patients that we've had in common, uh, whether they came to you first or they, or they came to me, we have uh, several patients in common and not all of them are, uh, doing any sort of gender change. So, um, oh. you know, I would say you guys do, do have, uh, a very specific eye and ability to treat just overall, I'd say bony contour and, and changes like that. So do you have patients who, let's say, are women who come in who have masculine features and you help soften them? Yes. This is, uh, the, there are two different paces. One are the, transgender patients who are looking for reaffirmment surgery just to, to make their features uh, less uh, aggressive, less, sorry, less, less masculine. They're very square. They want to, to make everything more delicate. But this is the same rule for women, as you said, but that maybe they, they have a very square jaw and they want to get a softer jawline or they have a very high forehead with pronounced uh, supraorbital reaches, an excess of bone, and a uh, high hairline, they, they want to lower it so they can looking for help because they, it's a very specific surgery that is not uh, very well known all over the world. We have the example of the Korean surgeons that they go for that V-line shape for the jawline, mm -hmm. but this is, this is not working on Caucasian patients. The V line is something that is completely away from the goals of our surgery. So we normally what we do is just recontour, removing excess of bone, removing a squareness, maybe getting uh, the smaller chins, for example. Yeah, and the um, the the main surgeries that that I've seen there. There's a lot of bony work that you guys do, but you do soft tissue work on top of it also, right? Um, mm -hmm. What happens, you know, it, it, is there a consequence of doing all this bony work on the soft tissues and is it age dependent? Is it, you know, do you see it more with younger or older 
Mm -hmm. That's mainly related as we are going to normally in FFS, uh, we are going to remove a structure from your face. What we're going to have is uh, less support for the soft tissues. Mm -hmm. Normally, this uh, is very well uh, recovered by the soft tissues of the patient if the surgery is not too big. So if we don't remove a lot of bone and if the patient is young, when we have found that patients over uh, 45, 50 year old, they normally have more difficulties to during the readaptation phase. So we mm -hmm. normally give like a six month, between six months to a year for the touch soft tissues to readapt to the bone. And if the bone has not, uh, if the soft tissues has not healed well and they have not, uh, we adapted it to, to the position they should be. This is when we find Ben Talay. <laughs> <laughs> so this so is our protocol. So yeah, it's first working on the bone, wait for the readaptation phase between six months to a year, year and a half, and then going for the readaptation of the soft tissues surgically or Maybe you can try with different uh, therapies, not so aggressive, but they don't work as well right. as maybe the lifting in your hands. Yeah, so, so I've actually seen a lot of patients uh, just for consultation. They'll come to me and they'll say, listen, I'm about to undergo all these surgeries and it's going to reduce the bony structure of my face. What are the options? Let's say I have, you know, laxity afterwards. So I, I discuss with them the options for facelifting for the jowls that can form and the, the softness in the, the front of the face that can form. Uh, typically, brow lifting you guys are doing at the same time yeah, uh, to, to get things going. And then we talk about lip lifting and then rhinoplasty, I think you might also do at the same time. So, so this photo that I'm showing, what was done on this patient? Yeah, this patient is a the very typical example of uh, uh, facial feminization surgery. So as you know, what we try to do first is the forehead is the number one femini feminizing surgery. The forehead recontouring is very typical to access the forehead from a hairline approach, which is the one that leaves a scar here with the main goal of reducing the distance of the forehead. Normally, this is a very common mistake between surgeons because high foreheads are feminine. The, the, the mistake comes from, uh, many men have these receiving temples on both sides. So the, the forehead looks like higher than female foreheads. So this is the main reason for many surgeons to try to lower the hairline, but they cannot correct the hairline itself, the shape, this M shape. For that reason, what we recommend is doing a hair transplant to close the temples. So the main reason we approach the forehead from here, a completely invisible incision. And what we are going to do is just removing bone of the frontal bossing. We use a special technique, which is the most complete and is the one that makes a reconstruction. It's a combination of bearing down the bone. Yeah. And sculpting the bone by bearing. But also we have to do a reconstruction of the anterior wall of the frontal sinus and reposition doing a setback, completely setback, um, mm -hmm. repositioning. So we need to fix with micro screws, mini plates, in some occasions, some titanium meshes to assure that the anatomy is restored after surgery. So we are going to get a functional frontal sinus and an optimal outcome for the surgery. So we can go as much back as we desire. So we remodel also the orbital rims. We can reshape the upper part, which normally in, in men is more square. And in women's more open. So this is going to enlighten the way the patients look and express with their eyes. And as a consequence of the surgery itself, the, the, the eyebrows are going to reposition higher, which is the brow lift effect that many, many patients have. Uh, they consult for because of this or they are convinced that they need this. Of course, we need to uh, leave this on a natural way. Mm. I think you have the same sense as we do. The, uh, our sense is very getting very natural results, avoiding that surgical look, which is horrible. It was very from the eighties, nineties, and it it was it, it came from the USA. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I've seen a, a lot of, uh, doctors who work in the world of, uh, facial feminization surgery, especially with rhinoplasty, they think that the way to feminize somebody is just to make like a fake mm, nose. A fake nose. Uh, yeah. Such, yeah, with such a small noses that normally we need to restore a, a soft transition between the nose and the forehead and also here on the zygomatic uh, buttresses. Mm -hmm. This patient also has operated the, the nose. Uh, lip lift is normally indicated, as you know, male have uh, longer upper lips and the mm -hmm. lower jaw is the surgery that also makes the difference. Of course, if the so, patient has some Adam's apple, we need to remove that too. Right. And, and, and so here, what did you do to this patient's jaw? If we're looking here laterally, it looks uh, like the angle of the mandible, the gonial yeah. angle. Has yeah, weakened. look at the, the chin's look at the projection. Projected. Yeah, the chin is completely re-sculpted. So we change the shape by removing bone. We remove the squareness. We make a more pointy shape or more oval. It depends on the anatomy and the patient's taste. Also removal of the angles. Mm -hmm. As you see on the photos, is uh, is a this a different? Uh, this is not her. Uh, ah, different patient. Okay. Scan. Okay. It... These are examples of what we can do. This is a very very graphic uh, slide that shows the main goal for the lower arch of the mandible. As you see, it's very square. Mm -hmm. Look at the green at the green regions that on the right are completely uh, removed. Gotcha. So, yeah, sorry, it's it's hard to see on the uh, with, <laughs> with Instagram. <laughs> so, so p part of what makes a jawline feminine is softening the angulation on the jaw, uh, on the anterior, yeah. on the inferior, and on the gonial angle, as you can so, see on on this patient. We we normally take a look first uh, to the borders, to the contour, uh, see if it's a square or not, and what needs to be removed. Normally, we need to remove height. On the mandible, so we remove height from the lower border. We remove the width, also the transversal part of the mandible. We remove but, uh, the angles itself, so mm -hmm. they they're going uh, like this instead of averting or flaring out. Many patients have this flaring, so we need to remodel that. We remove chin. The chin height needs to be balanced. If the patient has a very high chin, we need to remove it just to make uh, proportional with the rest of the lower third. And we have also to sculpt the bone itself to make this shape. Instead of having this squareness, you have like two big bumps mm -hmm. on the, on the, par this is called the parasymphysis area, which is normally where the bone accumulates because of testosterone. And then after that, we, uh, we study on the sagittal plane when on the profile, if the, if the chin needs to be advanced or it needs to be reduced in how prominent it is, so we can remove by bearing or we can do a sliding genioplasty to advance the chin. So it's a matter of playing with the with the bone itself. Right. And and so for rhinoplasty surgeons, when they look at this photo from before to after, uh, as a rhinoplasty surgeon, they would just want to build up the radix, the root of the nose. Mm -hmm. In this situation, you guys just brought down the brow and then did a, a rhinoplasty without building up the radix no yeah it depends there are patients who have like these greek noses where the nose emerge from this high part and that's also possible to to be softened or to remove that bone from the coronal approach from the from the forehead approach in mm -hmm. in other cases what we do first is always the forehead and after that we just uh, do the the rhinoplasty okay and and this patient, unfortunately, it kind of blocks, but this patient uh, yeah. over here, what was done? She was uh, operated the forehead, of course. Uh, I guess the hairline too. If you can show me the three-quarter. Uh, yeah, she has that band that normally what we do is just uh, doing a uh, corona approach for the forehead and her transplant to close temples. And if it's needed, lower the hairline as you have, mm -hmm. see the position of the eyebrows has changed a lot the way she shows the the upper eyelids 
uh, the nose Sorry, was vibrated. And, yeah. And then also we had the opportunity to modify the lower border of the, of the jaw. Yeah, this is a very like old a... case from facial team, but mm -hmm. it, it's so amazing. I think it's, it's one of my favorite patients. Yeah. And it makes a huge difference. And I do see, uh, you know, a, a lot of women who come in with these very, very strong features themselves. And they've been, so for this patient, for example, just looking at the before photo, uh, I do have a lot of women who come in like this and mm. they try to do fillers their whole lives to soften everything. So they keep adding filler to the temple, filler to the mid face to try to soften or balance the bone to the soft tissue. And this is something mm -hmm. that I try to explain to a lot of other doctors is that there, there is a, a, a balance that you're kind of fighting between the two. You need the soft tissue to match the bony skeleton. And if you have excess bony skeleton, you can't just keep going and adding on soft tissue or filler yeah. in that case. This is somebody who would benefit more from bony contouring and bony reduction. Uh, and I have several patients in my practice, but it's, it's something that, uh, you know, they come in for fillers. It's very difficult to tell them, listen, yeah, you're, you're they, never going to get the surgery. result you want. Yeah. Surgery mm -hmm. is the way to go because, you know, they have busy yeah. lives. They don't want surgery. It's a, it's a difficult conversation for me to, to have with them, but I do try to at some point at least make them aware of it. I say, Oh my God, you know, I've got this friend. He does really cool things. <laughs> and you know, and they, they say, run away <laughs> from the office. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you know, th this is another great case. And, um, so this is, it's again, I'm blocking the, the post, but, uh, what changes were made here? Cause the hair, the hairline looks a lot different. The eyebrows look a lot different. Uh, the, mm. the bony structure of the face is rounder and softer. Yeah. And also the lower jaw was approached and the, the Adam's apple. So she has the complete work that we can do in, in one single surgery, which normally is the forehead plus the simultaneous hair transplant, nose job, uh, lower border, uh, contouring of the jaw and Adam's upper removal. In some occasions we need to do some fat grafting, but it depends. And also this is not her case. And also the lip lift, it would be like the maximum is so many hours on surgery. But for these patients, the main change uh, is over here. As you mm -hmm. see, the, f the photo from the pre, uh, the pre b before surgery is before the patient had uh, started the hormonal treatment. As you see, she has a lack of fat support here where the Vichat is, mm -hmm. um, she has a very square shape for the lower jaw, very powerful chin. Also the nose is not very masculine, but up to some degree is a little excessive. And the main problem in her case was in this area, in the, in the forehead and mm -hmm. very orbital area. So if you can change, it's how the, the brain works, it's how our brain works is, uh, all the time during all our life, just in a glance, we can uh, see or foresee how a, the other person that you're looking at is feeling just by looking at the eyes. So when you look at their eyes, you can feel if they are feeling sadness or they're tired or they are happy. So mm -hmm. if we can remove, we can change and modify this frame, the brain is going to reassign the gender. It's automatic. It's something that is how our, our brain works. So this is the main power for our surgeries. Yes. Mm -hmm. Changing this frame is going to make the gender uh, recognition system of our brain work completely different. And, and what role does the hormone therapy have? Do you, uh, do, do you guys initiate hormone therapy or do you send it to, to no. somebody? No, normally they come to us yet for the surgery. So they have to come with the diagnosis, two year diagnosis from a psychiatrist and the hormonal therapy replace, hormonal replacement therapy is, is not mandatory for the patients, but we mm -hmm. always uh, encourage them because the results that we can get with it 
are much better because everything gets softer. Uh, they lose thickness for the skin. They gain a uh, volume on their cheeks and key areas that many women has more volume on the cheeks. This area more plenty. Uh, also the brightness on the skin. Normally if they have uh, hair on the face, they have to do some kind of therapy like hair removal, electrolysis, mm. things like that. Normally they can, they come for, for the surgery with one year hormone treatment, which is the minimum that the body requires. So with the hormonal treatment before going through it, you do have them see a psychiatrist? And, and then the, the, normally the endocrinologist is the one that leads the, the therapy. Mm -hmm. And um, have you noticed, is, is, is hormone therapy something that everyone can tolerate or uh, do some patients emotionally have problems? And I, I ask because I've seen... <clears throat> When uh, patients start taking estrogen, meaning they're uh, kind of transferring from, from male to female, it doesn't seem as difficult as when they're going from female to male and they're taking testosterone. I've seen a lot of, kind of um, with, with some patients, a lot of emotional liability or, or uh, kind of a little more uh, exaggerated behavior when they're going from mm. female to male. It also happens in the opposite. We, we don't have a great experience on masculinization. So we, I cannot tell you, uh, how different are the changes. But what our patients tell us is that normally they get depressed or they feel weaker. They have uh, changes on humor. Uh, it's difficult to get the balance with the hormone therapy. Once they have got it, it's perfect because they are very stable and they are their cells. Mm. They are not, they have not changed. Uh, this is the main reason for us that we don't interrupt the treatment for the surgery. We just, as you know, the, the hormone therapy is, is pro thrombotic. So we need to do some anticoagulant therapy before surgery, but that's all. And how, how do you do that? Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm curious because I've had patients who, um, with, uh, you know, they're taking the, the estrogen or, or the hormone replacement. What do you do for the anticoagulation? We do like an oxaparin before surgery. The day before surgery, we start the protocol. And as soon as they go back to do normal work, which is the first day, we, we reintroduce the destroyers. So it's just mm -hmm. the, the day before, the day of the surgery, and one day extra, one extra day. And and when patients come to go through these kind of surgeries, uh, do a lot of them have family with them supporting them, or, or are they coming alone? And I, I ask because it's a, it, it is a, an area of change that a lot of families give difficulty with. And I've seen that, you know, your center is such a nice place to be. I wonder, you know, how you guys make that easier. Yeah, we, we try uh, for our patients to come with their family because it's always easier. But luckily, many of them come uh, by their own because many of them has made a break during their life. This is like the, the surgery is like the goal that they were looking for during the, her whole life, facial, genital, whatever. And this is like the change. Many of them are separated because they're partners uh, didn't share the same spirit or they are not in love anymore or they want to get the divorce or maybe if they don't previously they had a uh, family uh, normally they are uh, accompanied by their parents or but we there is no rule for this uh, i would mm -hmm. say 50 50 of them come on their own and all other, when they come with their family, it's perfect because they are so comprehensive with the patient. They are accompanying them all the time, supporting them the whole time. They are like taking care uh, during the post of recovery. Yeah. It seems like uh, there's it's a very lot nice. Of, there are a lot like of stories. Lot of about this. I'm sorry. Yeah. It seems like there's a lot of infrastructure needed, um, which is why it's nice. You know, you guys have something called facial team. So, um, just what we've even talked about going through the surgery, you have to have, if it's feminizing in terms of, uh, you know, gender change, you, you do have, 
a psychiatrist involved initially, you have an endocrinologist involved for hormonal treatment, you have uh, amongst your team, I'm sorry? Uh, also a psychologist that is giving support before and after surgery and during the first year, mm -hmm. which is also very important. Uh, Marina section sees uh, our psychologist and she gives a lot of support. She also does some um, group sessions every week with uh, many of the of the patients that are recovering the, at the hotel. We don't have an official accommodation, but there is a place where we recommend to go because many of them feel very comfortable there. They have like their private uh, lunches and places where they can eat together and share experiences. And it's very nice. So the support of the psychologist is very important. We also have the hair team, which are dermatologists and the technicians for the hair transplant. We have the dermatologists for maybe soft tissue work of derm derma work. Mm -hmm. We also have the physiotherapists. Uh, many, many people, yeah. Like a puncher, yes. and then we have physiologists. Yeah, so it takes a, a huge uh, group to really make sure the whole process is complete and, and easy. The, uh, you know, the, the surgeries I get, they're a lot easier than this. They just come in and yeah. <laughs> I do a little bit of facelift and it's, it's, many it's done. Many people who come to visit for service trip to Marbella and they come to the offices where every, all the people are working there always as is typical from surgeons. What are these people make? What, what do they do under? What, why are they here? Why do you need them? And yeah, surgery is, is the, the, is the most important thing, but it's the, it's like routine. It is every day, but the rest, what is around the trans patient, the, this type of surgery coming to a different country, this needs a lot of work from the, from marketing team. And also the coordinators, which are really important. We have a, a group of a lot of coordinators are, which are the contact between facial team and the patients until they know the surgeons or they know yeah. the hospital uh, staff. So I would say one of the most important uh, roles for the facial team are the coordinators who are looking, yeah. taking care of the patient. Uh, during the whole process. Right, and, and so the photo that we're looking at is your actual facility in Marbella. Yes, this is our hospital. It's a very small hospital. We have uh, four operating rooms, uh, 12, uh, no, I think now we have with the works, I think we have 17 rooms, but it is very small. It's not that typical uh, facility of a hospital. This was mm -hmm. uh, like a summer house, from um, famous VIP people in Marbella some years ago before it was converted into a hospital. So we have this uh, big garden with a swimming pool. We also have our facilities are uh, apart from, from the hospital itself. And it's very comfortable that you go to the OR and then you scrap, but then you finish your work and then you can go for a consultation and then you can scrub again uh, this is very easy. It's completely yeah. different from what we were used to. It's a very uh, nice place. In one place. To, yeah, it's a very nice place to, to be for you and and for the patients. So yeah, it's you know it it, it says something though having a surgery center or uh, a recovery center that is in such a peaceful place. It really makes it easier to go through such difficult surgery for people. I feel for for everybody because there could be a lot of stress involved in this and. Being mm -hmm. in a nice, relaxing area, I feel like does change the, you know, el, el medio ambiente, you know, <laughs> the, the, the whole kind yeah, of surrounding of atmosphere. The environment. Mm. Yeah, it changed everything. And also the treat is always much more personal with the nurses during the hospitalization. They know each other by their names. They grab their, it's very close. It's like a family, a small family. You, can go out from the operating room and then you meet the patient who is uh, taking a walk uh, around the garden because of it's a sunny weather so they can go out walk and you can talk to them easily it's it's very 
grateful. It's mm -hmm. a total change. Uh, I always say I'm not working. Uh, this is just like having fun all the time. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. And uh, the other thing I'm, I'm curious about that we, we talked about briefly, and we talked about the brows and the jaws, the, the nose and the lip. Um, how often are you doing lip lifts for feminization surgery? How, how integral is it? Uh, for, for no, patients. normally it's, it's, I would say it's one of every four or five patients, uh, mm. needs a lip lip. It depends as you know, on the age mainly, uh, when they are over 50, the indication is almost, uh, indicated for every patient, but not all of them, uh, want this surgery because of the scar itself. Uh, since we perform your technique, Ben, Everything has changed. So we're very happy with that, uh, that tricks that you saw to us. And lip lift is a great, great surgery that I think is a key surgery for FFS. Yeah, helping rebalance everything. And I, I've, uh, I stay on some of the forums and online discussions in these uh, groups for FFS uh, across the world. And they, they also have when they try to draw out for their patients, here are the procedures that you commonly need to do. Uh, it mm -hmm. is typically brow or skull recontouring, uh, rhinoplasty, lip lift, and then jawline restructuring, you know, and whether that's mm -hmm. uh, orthognathic or just, uh, you know, moving it around or just kind of shaving things. Um, and so with, with the different surgeries, you have, you know, you have these different surgeons. What does each one of them do here? Are, are you guys, do you guys overlap or are you all, cause there's six of you? In, yeah, in some fields we overlap. The one on the left is Raul, who is the nose guy. He's the rhino surgeon. He only does the rhino and also soft tissue work. I normally try to, to assist him and also perform some techniques on the aesthetic way. And I'm also more focused on the lower jaw. So I'm also, I do the orthognathic work uh, with Daniel Simon, who is the one in the center with the bear. He's mm -hmm. one of the founders. The Both of, of them, the two that are in the front are the founders of the company, of patient team. They started with this uh, more than 10 years ago. So they are, very nice guy. They are genius. They are so nice people. And uh, Luis Capitan is the other one, the other founder, the director. Uh, he's specialized on the forehead and the Adam Sapo. Carlos, which is between the two of them, is uh, more focused also on the forehead. And then is our last uh, uh, sign is Miguel who is uh, more related to also the lower jaw and Adam Sabo. Also perform some fat grafting and things like that. We overlap in some fields, but if we can choose, we normally are two of us uh, performing surgery at the same time. We have normally two operating rooms at the same time. So we mm -hmm. can switch from one to the other, depending on, on uh, the region that is operating. So we have one person who is trying to control the times in the OR so that one procedure is not at the same time. For example, the nose, uh, that they don't go at the same time. It's like a chess play. It's yeah. complicated for that. Yeah. yeah, well, I, you know, I think it's amazing. Um, hopefully uh, we get to go to another meeting again soon. Uh, again, for, for patients who didn't listen to our introduction of Javier, uh, he is always lecturing around the world and in the meetings that I've gone to, which are this, uh, s similar to the meetings with uh, Bruno and uh, Eduardo yeah. Mann and Kyle Stanley, uh, Christopher Coachman, they're really educational and incredible for any kind of surgeon, anything you do. So the combined meetings that we've gone to with plastic surgeons, uh, or a maxillofacial surgeons, dentists, those really have been the most enlightening for me in terms of going and learning so much in such a small amount of time, more so than any of my own academy meetings that I've been to for, for facial plastic surgery. And the differences really 
are that you're getting a perspective that you wouldn't get otherwise. Mm -hmm. You're you're not listening to the same facelift lecture over and over again. You're you're hearing from people who approach the face in an entirely different way, and that really changes the way that you look at it. So listening to your lectures and seeing what you've done with bony movements has completely changed the way I do fillers. It's changed the way I do facial surgery and the way I recommend to patients what they need because now I look at people totally differently. I, I do see patients who come in who are women with excess bony structure and I'm more easily able to imagine and envision now, you know what, this is actually what they need instead of just having the mindset of, you know, the, the hammer and the nail where everything's, you know, just add volume, soften things. Yeah, it's awesome. You really start to see, yeah, so you can send them to somebody who very consistently and easily can soften the face with bony contour changes and not have an extended healing time, which is what a lot of people are afraid of. And as you know, it's much more predictable surgery than the soft tissue work because normally the predictability of the soft, for example, the nose or even the lifting, the way one side heals is completely different from the other side, even you have done this exactly the same. So this with the bone, normally it doesn't happen. So we have this advantage for that. For us, yeah, think, uh, we have the, yeah, we have even guides that allow us to plan in virtually what we're going to do and translate that into the operating room. So we know mm -hmm. exactly what we're going to do and how we're going to do. It doesn't depend on your hand or if, if you had a bad night or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And it does, uh, it is something that's more mathematical in the way that it's done because uh and craniofacial surgeons the plastic surgeons who do craniofacial work understand that because they're doing cephalometrics they're really looking at the the bony changes and saying okay i'm going to remove exactly three millimeters i'm going to do exactly this uh soft tissue surgery is not really like that soft tissue surgery you go you release what you can you lift what you can uh and it doesn't have that sort of kind of elemental science behind it that you have with these kind of surgeries so it is very impressive to me how you can show the patients, you know, the changes they're going to get predictably and get the exact thing mm. that you set out to do. It's, it's really incredible. And a lot of the time you help people with their bite and the way their teeth are structured at the same time going through <clears> this, <throat> which is really, really nice. So and also I have, if, uh -huh. sorry, no, I just want to say that, uh, what you were saying before the, the, those type of congresses that a lot of specialities come together for the same purpose, but with different visions uh, are going to enrich you for sure. Uh, for me, it was very important uh, seeing the dentists who are very, uh, I would say, non well treated by other physicians. Mm -hmm. And they don't normally, they laugh at them because, and we have to learn a lot from the dentists. I have not, I haven't seen before such good presentations as they do they 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 are so high level with very very specific work but the, all together they started before much more than the surgeons yeah so they are yeah their presentations are yeah i think my presentations are the worst yours are like <laughs> <laughs> but, but really the yeah the, the the way they present information and teach is unbelievable there are very few plastic surgeons in the in the academy meetings i've seen that are able to do that there are some but it's a few um so it, it, it's great to just learn from everybody and, and see how it goes mm -hmm. so the uh i would say if, if anybody wants to get in touch with you they can reach out to you easily on on instagram on either the the facial team instagram or your own which is this one or they can go to is it facialteam.eu is that your website EU, yeah yeah like EU, europe yeah, it's facialteam.eu. Yeah, they can reach through very easily uh, for professional patients, whatever needed. Uh, we also have for professional like training programs, uh, workshops where we teach what we know. We're collaborating with Johns Hopkins, uh, mm -hmm. which is, as you know, one of the most famous world leaders in medicine field. Yeah. So we're collaborating with them, trying to have a uh, very scientific work in what we do. We like to publish scientific articles uh, in 
very specific journals. So we try to do everything very subtle. We have just um, published an article which we consider very important, which is the protocol, like what it should be done during FFS, because nowadays everyone is doing what they can or what they know, and, but this is not taught at the faculty. This is not taught during the residency programs. So it's a completely new, even these techniques are older than more, more than 40 years old. But this is not very well known. So we need to set everything into some rules or way of doing things mm -hmm. because of the well for our patients. We need this for our patients. Awesome. All right, Javier, thank you so much. I think we'll end it here. And then if anybody has questions, you can reach out directly to Javier or the, the facial team and their <laughs> thousands doctors and practitioners that they have over there. <laughs> right, Thank you very much, Ben. Enjoy yourself over there. Are you in Barcelona or in Marbella right now? You're in no, I co confined in Barcelona, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, there's worse places to be. So <laughs> enjoy yourself <laughs> over there, okay? Take care, man. Have a nice day.